So let's go on to the new data that we need to incorporate into practice, Tiffany, the Olympiad data. Could, could you tell us about that? Happy to, I think this is exciting data. So Olympiad was a randomized phase three trial of almost about 300 women who were germline BRCA mutation carriers, and this was on central testing. Um, they were women who had less than two prior lines of chemotherapy, and I think a really key point here, as we've been talking about platinums, is that a portion of these women had prior exposure to a platinum, but you could not have progressed on platinum-based chemotherapy. So these women were randomized to either single-agent elaparib or treatment of physician's choice, which was a reasonable list of standard drugs that we use for metastatic breast cancer, um, excluding a platinum, right? So there was no platinum-based therapy in that control arm. And so the primary endpoint was uh, median progression-free survival. And the trial robustly met its primary endpoint. So PFS improved from about four months to seven months. And that was about a 42 or 48% improvement in progression-free survival. Um, other efficacy endpoints, there was a doubling of response rate from 30 to about 60% favoring elaparib. And this is, again, a single agent oral therapy for patients. Um, in terms of toxicity, um, elaparib as a single agent was really relatively well tolerated. There was some hematologic toxicity of a bit of anemia, which I think was no surprise to folks from the phase two experiences, and a bit of nausea and vomiting. Although when you looked at how that compared to treatment of physician's choice chemotherapy, um, in fact, the discontinuation from therapy due to adverse events was lower with elaparib than it was with standard chemotherapy, and it was rather uncommon. Um, the study actually looked at quality of life endpoints as well, and I think something that was very reassuring was that the time to a deterioration in quality of life was prolonged with elaparib over chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So I think we had encouraging efficacy data. The study met its primary endpoint, um, as well as a, a nice tolerability profile and improvement in quality of life, really what it meant to our patients. And so that it made itself right into the New England Journal of Medicine mm -hmm. and then right to the FDA okay. um, exactly. approval. Um, so what do you think the, um, the, the impact is on our, our, our standard practice? Is this gonna be a kind of a, a game changer for the germline BRCA patients, do you think? Or? I do, I think there are a few things that I took away from these data. Number one is how critically important it is to know a patient's germline BRCA status. So we've talked about NCCN guidelines already and this is really a reminder to make sure we're not missing patients that could have the opportunity to have access to this treatment. I think that we then divide out by biology um, what we're doing in the triple negative setting and what we're doing in the ER positive setting. Like these patients were HER2 normal, so that's a separate category altogether. Um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for patients with germline BRCA mutations and triple negative breast cancer to see that we had improved progression-free survival um, in an, with an agent that was so well tolerated, that was oral, that did not have alopecia associated with it, is really a win. And I think it moves up to first line opportunity for patients. Um, in the ER positive setting, again, compared to chemotherapy, this was superior. So I, I still think uh, this would be sequenced at some point following endocrine therapy. I'd be happy to offer a laparib to my patients over chemotherapy. Right? Mm -hmm. We all know when uh, clinically we're making that transition from an endocrine approach to a chemo approach. And I see a laparib moving in earlier for our patients with germline mutations. Mutations. 